How does delusion inspire author Andre Graton? Sit down, get comfortable, because on this week's episode of All About Canadian Books, we're going to ask her. But before we do, for the latest author interviews and behind the book stories, if you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel. Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher and welcome back. I am so excited to have two guests with me this week. I have Quebec author Andre Graton and her translator Ian Thomas Shaw as guests. Andre studied philosophy and classical studies in Montreal, Berlin and Strasbourg. She teaches philosophy in Montreal and loves swimming in cold water. And I will ask about this because I'm very intrigued about this. And Ian Thomas Shaw, he's a novelist, a translator, editor, former Canadian diplomat who has lived in Europe, Africa, the Middle East. And Ian speaks English, French, German, Spanish, and some Arabic. We'll be talking today about Andre's award-winning novel, Choosing Eleanor, which was published by Edition de la Pleine Lune and Guernica Editions in English. Welcome, you two. Welcome, welcome. And to give you a little taste about what Andre's book is about, here we go. So Choosing Eleanor tells the story of a one-way friendship and it explores the delusion of being loved. This is Marianne's story, and she is obsessed with Eleanor. And from the very first sentence, long before we met, Eleanor was dreaming of me. Not with this hair, these two hands, or the sound of my voice. No, of me as a friend, an ideal friend. We feel that something is wrong in her perception of reality. But who is this Eleanor, whom Marianne has never spoken to? What's so fascinating about her? And it doesn't matter, humiliation, rebuffs, rejection, Marianne is certain that Eleanor loves her. And it is a great book. Welcome you two. I'm so excited to ask you both questions. So Andre, you love cold water swimming. Yes, I do. <laughs> oh my goodness. Is this like in the winter you mean or? Mm, the sooner, uh, the sooner possible. Uh, like maybe in May I could start. Uh, okay. uh, no, no, April, my first swim is around there when uh, there is some ice. <laughs> and uh, yes, I, I love this, but I love to swim in the uh, North Quebec Lake, you know, and um, uh, I, yeah, I love it. <laughs> oh, you are much braver than I. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Ian, you were a diplomat in Africa, Middle East for over 34 years. Um, was it a big culture shock for you to come back to Canada? Yeah, it was a fairly big culture shock. Actually, um, I was an international development worker in, in Africa mm -hmm. and also in the Gaza Strip. And then I came back to Canada to become a, a diplomat. So I served oh. as a diplomat twice in the Middle East and also in Germany. And then I had a number of headquarters jobs, but it was a big, it was a, a big shock. I realized um, I'd also worked with the Crees in Northern Quebec. Mm -hmm. And I realized that many years had passed uh, before I actually worked with people that came from the same background as, as me as colleagues, you know, uh, who yeah. spoke English as their first language or French as their first language. And uh, the cultural differences were quite stark in the way people worked in Canada compared to when you work in an international setting. Yeah, yeah. And um, Andre, mm -hmm. where did you get the idea to write Choosing Eleanor? <sighs> It's a good question. I don't know in my head, maybe. I think uh, it, it, 
it starts with uh, like an intuition, uh, an idea of uh, a voice, uh, the the voice of the desire, the Marianne's desire, yeah. and um, I just start to listen to it, and uh, I wrote about it. Yeah. yeah. So Mar Marianne came first. Yes, Marianne came first. Marianne yes. Came first. Yes. The, now um, Marianne and Eleanor, they're both very interesting women, very interesting women. And what would you like the readers to know about each of these women before they start reading about them? Mm. Well, Eleanor is the woman that, uh, I don't know, is a mysterious, uh, it's, a, it's like a, a ghost uh, of a woman for to start, and then she she gets to be more defined by the the how uh, Marianne sees her, mm -hmm. but it, we never reach we we never we never know really Eleanor is she's she could be any anybody um, she's the object of the desire she's just you know, and um, Marianne is really. Um, uh, so uh, um, lonely, lonely woman yeah. um, uh, who needs to see something uh, outside her, uh, and she needs to to be seen too. And um, it doesn't work. So she's uh, giving all all of her energy to just to 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 uh, to access to uh, a, a look uh, of. Uh, something else and so somebody else uh, yeah I don't know if it's good yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah as a reader I felt so sad when I was reading for Marianne because you you just can feel and I think all of us can relate to the desire and the, of wanting to be loved and accepted mm -hmm. by someone so I I, I really enjoyed that mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Andre do you think that anyone can be dis dis delusional in their relationships? Uh, maybe in a spectrum, <laughs> we could uh, be, uh, but yes, I think uh, we can experiment uh, this kind of, you know, desire to, to be the one, to be um, the, the choosing one also, and um, the chosen one, yes, uh, but maybe not as, as Marianne, we, we don't uh, go um, this far, but I think, uh, yeah, everybody at a certain level can uh, can relate to uh, the, the Marianne's desire, yeah. Mm. Now, mm. as a writer, I mean, you, you, you wrote your book in French and then you passed it over to Ian for translation. Was it hard for you to pass your work over to somebody else? Mm. No, uh, Ian is doing a great job, and uh, yeah, I, I really trust him. Uh, I, yeah, no, no, I, I, I was really happy to to see the book uh, having a second life, and uh, uh, yes, it's a it's, it's it's a good thing. I'm I'm enjoying this process. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so Ian, as as a translator, like I know it's so much more than taking a story in, from one language into another. So what, like, what is your process? Do you speak with the author first? Do you read the book first? What, what do you do? Well, uh, of course, I, I read the book uh, more than once, you know, before I made the offer to translate it. And uh, I talked to my own publisher, Guernica Editions, mm -hmm. uh, which has published my last novel, to see if they were interested in publishing a translation of Andre's book. Oh. And they, they agreed, and then uh, they made an uh, offer to Edition de la Pleine Lune mm -hmm. and to Andre to purchase the, the rights to, to have the book translated. But um, you're asking about the process. I, I didn't actually, I met Andre before. I met her oh. at uh, the Montreal Book uh, Festival, um, and uh, we chatted a little bit. Uh, but I didn't really engage Andre on a kind of a weekly basis or even monthly basis in discussing with her the translation. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a draft translation and then I sent that to, to Andre and to uh, 
Mary Madeleine, an edition de la pleine lune, and they read it through, and Andre came back with some very astute remarks about certain things, and we corrected that. And then I continued to work on it a bit, polishing the English as I, I went along. Um, so that's the process was really, you know, I mean, I know the milieu. Uh, I used to live in Montreal, and I used to live in Montreal, not very far from where uh, the book takes place, uh, where Eleanor's apartment is. Yeah. And uh, at that time, I was fairly integrated into life in Montreal, and I was still in my uh, 30s at the time, early 30s, late 20s, mid 20s. And so I, you know, these were the type of people I knew. Maybe right. not as uh, exceptional as Eleanor was, because she's a very exceptional character. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, basically I understood what was going on in society at that time and how people lived. And so the descriptions in uh, Andre's novella really struck me as very authentic, something very real. I could imagine having met Eleanor or Marianne in Montreal, you know. Yeah, yeah. And that helped with the translation. And then the question was how to get the, the wording so they would it would resonate in the yeah. same way with the English readers. And that's always a, a big challenge. Yes, yes. So how, how do you ensure that you, that you do that you get that? Well which you, you did. Know, <laughs> exactly. I mean part of it is, you know, the first time you, you translate it, you know. You know, I'm bilingual and I speak both languages and I, I still live in Quebec. Uh, so you, you hear the author's voice. Yes. And the first time you translate, you keep in a number of things probably that would make the voice sound foreign to an English reader, but not foreign to me because this is the way I hear people. Right. So I had to kind of reread it and say to myself, okay, how is this going to be perceived by unilingual Anglophone reader? And then I, you know, had to polish and polish and polish until it sounded very authentic mm -hmm. to an English reader as if it wasn't a translation. And, and I think that's the goal, is to convince the reader or to make the reader believe that they're reading something that's originally written in English. Yes. Uh, and th that was the goal. Yeah. So, so really, at the end of the day, it's a lot of polishing sentence by sentence yeah. and reading it back out loud to yourself. Yeah, yeah. No, that's interesting because, you know, you often wonder that with so many books when they are taken into um, so many different languages, the process. So thank you for that. I, I find that really, really interesting. Um, Andre. I really loved, and I won't spoil the ending for everyone, but the book left me with so many questions, so many other questions. Mm -hmm. So as the writer, um, do you have the answers for 10 years from now where Marianne is? Oh, I hope she's better. <laughs> uh, I, I, I really like her. I really... Uh, uh, yes, uh, having so much tenderness for her. Um, yes. um, well, I think sh she'll get fine. She she'll find somebody, and um, she'll know about herself. Maybe um, what's what's the difference between um, uh, the the desire, uh, what the desire makes her look, um, and well. The reality, if it's possible, and um, yeah, the, I I I think so. I think she's she'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, so, Ian, you're also a novelist as well as a translator. What are you currently working on? Well, right now I'm renovating my house. Ah! <laughs> As soon as I finish that, which should be fairly soon, I plan to get into a writing regime where I'm writing every day. And uh, I've had a novel in mind for quite a while. Um, 
a novel which takes place in France and in and Spain, in the province of Catalonia in Spain, mm -hmm. and with flashback chapters to France during the occupation of France uh, during the Second World War. And uh, it centers around the same character, uh, the, the character who is a young boy, a teenager, who is a Spanish refugee, a Catalan refugee, that goes to France after the Spanish Civil War mm -hmm. and then is caught up during the G German occupation of France by joining the French resistance. So those are the, the, the flashback chapters. Yeah. And in the present day chapters, he's a man in his early 90s. Uh, he's at the end of his life. He's been a, a literary and cultural critic for his entire life in France after, you know, after the war very cultured man, and he has a young friend who is a French-Canadian journalist who was a friend of his nephews. His nephew dies, and she continues to keep in touch with him, and she asks him to go with her back to Spain, back to Catalonia, to act as an interpreter and as a facilitator in making contacts with people in the Catalan nationalist movement. The Catalans are seeking independence and also people in the Spanish left because he has these decades old contacts with these type of people and, and he agrees to do it. Mm. So in some ways it's a return to his homeland. His homeland is not very far away. I mean, he lives in the South of France, but it's a cultural and spiritual journey back mm. to his, his homeland, which is now caught up in this competition between nationalism, local nationalism, and the idea of socialism and a greater Spain and these concepts. So through this trip back, we learn, I, I think, about what the conflict was or is in Catalonia, mm. a contemporary conflict without violence or anything. It's a political conflict. And with the flashback chapters, we learn about what was the experience of Spanish uh, refugees in France during the Second World War? So there is this, this issue of where authoritarianism sort of drifts around, you know, where one person's perception of what a nation is suppresses another person's perception, one person's perception of what ideologically the world should be oppresses another person's and conflicts evolve from that. So it's in a way, I hope the novel will be understanding how conflicts arise. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, I'm, in, I'm intrigued. That sounds great. <laughs> Andre, what about you? What are you currently working on? Well, I'm trying uh, very hard to finish uh, my second novel. And um, yeah, I think uh, it will be uh, finished uh, at the end of the summer, May of, like something like this. Yes, I hope so, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can can we can we may I ask what the novel is about? Uh, well, I, I really <laughs> admire Ian to to be able to speak about uh, his oh. novel. Uh, um, for me, it's really hard when I'm working on it. It's just like uh, if I would betray my <laughs> novel, and I don't know. Uh, uh, but um, it's around the the necessity of building a road uh, um, and. Um, well, this road will uh, cause uh, some uh, really um, difficult situation for some type of people. And uh, yeah, it's, it's about that. It's around that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Andre, I think you have done so well speaking in English today. I like so, <laughs> so well. I, like I said to you earlier, I wish I could be asking you questions in French. So <laughs> thank you. yeah, no, you did, it, fabulous. So mm -hmm. thank you so much, Ian Thomas Shaw and Andre Graton. I enjoyed speaking with you both today. I will put links down below in the description box with um, so you can find both Ian and Andre and their own books and also learn more about them on their websites. There will also be a link to uh, Guernica's website so you can purchase a copy of Choosing Eleanor. And it is a really interesting read ah yes there it is ian has a ian has a copy and that is a gorgeous cover by the way 
I really yes. love that cover. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. So links to purchase copies of the book. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you very much. Kato. It was my pleasure. My pleasure. And to everyone watching, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Bye bye, Andre. Bye, Jan. See you. Yeah.